book of 1 Kings chapter 19. The Bible and its messages always addresses areas of our life. Um, there's not an area of your life that God does not address. This morning as we look at our hearts and our lives, we'll find and we'll know that all of us are in different pages and chapters and lines and paragraphs of our lives and we are all dealing with diverse and different things. And um, you would think when you get to be at my age that you'd been through everything, but I find it's not so, amen? I was looking in the mirror the other day just coming out of bathing and I started thinking about wearing a t-shirt when I'm in front of the mirror, amen, just to keep the mirror from laughing at me. So I think I quit growing muscle and keep growing and kept growing skin. I don't know how that happens, but it, the Bible addresses every area of our life and there's not one area of your life or my life that God doesn't have an answer for. And the only answer that will suffice in these areas of your life and my life, the only, the only answer that will make the difference is the answers that come from this eternal book. I've often said that this book is the only book that when you buy it, you get the, the author with it, and he explains to you what you need to know about his book. It's an amazing book. It's called the Bible. Amazing, wonderful, powerful book. I don't think there's anything in life that will change your life more than the effect of this, of this book. We started a series, we stepped aside last Sunday for the dedication of the Lord's building, and we, we've been talking about overcoming, and this morning I want to talk about overcoming discouragement. Overcoming discouragement. The doctor got his financial report and see that he was upside down, and he was spending more than he was taking in with all the expenses of insurances and liabilities, and Finally, he determined he was going to take the collection part of it into his own hands. Finally, he called the lady that had a check that had bounced and said, Ma'am, Miss Susie, I just called to tell you, this is your doctor, and wanted to tell you that your check has bounced. It has come back. And she said, Doctor, thank you so much for calling me, but so has my arthritis come back. Thank you. And she hung up. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I need to laugh. How about you? Amen. I just think that's funny. Discouragement is something that everyone and all of us have to deal with in life. No matter how, how strong you might be at one moment, the very next moment you'll find that you'll be handling personally discouragement. And others might just say, hey, don't pay attention to it, but when you've got it and you're going through it, it's a different deal, amen? It's a whole different deal. Discouragement is just one degree, if you understand, in the place of coming distressed, and then after distress is the, you know... Uh, you just want to quit, end it all. The story here is the story of, of the man of God by the name of Elijah. And he just had a big bout with the king and said, guess what, bud? This is your Baptist preacher here, and it's not fixing to rain three for three years unless I say it's going to rain, except for my word, chapter 17. Not going to rain. And then he got in a real big fuss with them, and he challenged my friend and put himself out on the line and said, now you bring all you prophets of Baal. We'll see who has the real God of Israel upon them. And remember the story before it was all done. He prayed and the fire came down, those 66, what, 66 words of that prayer. And buddy, it just smoked that whole place. Well, the word got back to the king. That wasn't the problem. You know, I'd rather have 10 men mad at me than one woman. How about you, amen? If you got any sense, you could whoop 10 men, but you can't whoop one woman. I mean, there's just something. They just don't quit, Amen. I don't know where that comes from. I didn't get that out of the Bible, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's gospel, amen? amen? And Ahab said, guess what, darling? <laughs> oh, Elijah just killed all those boys that you've been feeding, all your spiritual leaders. And you find this text in the reading, and she said to him, hey, son, tomorrow about this time, let the gods do to me if I don't kill you, just like you killed those guys. Let's read it. We better read it. Verse 2 of chapter 19. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Go and let the gods do to me, and more also if I make not thy life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. <laughs> Son, you got about 24 hours, and you are a cooked coconut, but you did. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servants there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a Jupiter, juniper tree 
and he requested for himself that he might die. He's a little bit goofed up about now. Can you see that? He runs to stay alive, and then he quits and said, God, just kill me. I'm done. Amen. He's messed up in the head. You with me? Amen. You've never been like that, are you? Amen. You run from the one that's wanting to kill you, and at the same time, you, you're so discouraged, so distraught, so depressed that you want to die. You see no hope any way you look. And he said, it's enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father. As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because of the journey is too great for thee. Very interesting story. I'm amazed that this man comes to the place of being discouraged. But I'm also amazed at the times and places in my life when I've come to that place of discouragement. Survey taken by the National Institute of Mental Health declare this, that depression will have certain effects on it. It'll, have, you'll, it'll affect the way you sleep, the lack of your energy, the joy in your life. You'll find it difficult, many times hard to get out of bed. They even said that you'll want to pull the covers over and stay in. It'll affect every part of you, even your productivity. Ronnie Robin says, in America today, in 2017, one out of 10 Americans take antidepressants, one out of 10. Now, you're not normal, I'm not normal, and so I'm, I'm praying and trusting that that is not accurate with this crowd here this morning, amen? But now think about that for just a minute. One out of 10 people in America take antidepressants because of discouragement. One in four, this is, this is tough, one in four are ladies from the age of 40 to 50. That, 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 that shocks me. Here's what's really interesting, that two-thirds do not have any clinical depression, but they still prescribe to antidepressant medicine. Now, so, so you got two-thirds of those that take it. Only one-third of them have real, real clinical depression. But two-thirds of them take the antidepressants, though they have no, they just feel, they just think they're that way. Listen as I make some transitions and follow with me in your mind. We live in a society, my friend, that's determined to live without God, and so they medicate their problems, okay? Now, they medicate their problems. Let me stop right here and clarify, I'm not a doctor. I have been given a doctor degree, but you don't want me to doctor you. Can I tell you that, amen? I, you don't want me to be your doctor. Now, so if you're taking medications, don't quit taking them because I'm bringing you this message this morning. You understand what I'm saying? Are you with me? Okay, don't, don't do it. But can I say that we're in a generation, my grand, that the answer and the way to get through life and its problems is to medicate problems. Listen to the words that I use, my words I use. They're, they just literally fool the brain. They poison the brain so it can't think right as it should normally. Can I say that God made me to have a good time without anything in me or anything on me? Amen. I don't need to put it here or snuff it up there or put, put it on here, buddy. Amen? Amen? I don't need it. And you don't need it. If you are where God wants you to be, you'll deal with some things. But those as well are tools in God. Listen to Jeremiah 2 and 13. For my people have committed two evils. Listen to this word. Get a hold of it. I want to go slow. I want you to gather this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountains of living water. God said, they have forsaken me, the fountains of living waters, and have um, hewn them out cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, that they've went about without me, having to make a substitute. And they've not only abandoned me, but they've made their own ways to make it happen. Bruce Lenny, a psychologist, wrote a book, Common Sense in Rebellion. And in the book, there's, there's a statement that I'm just going to say, for what it's worth, uh, you take it and receive it as he wrote it. He said, no biochemical or neurolog neurology, one more time, neurological or generic drug can help depression, anxiety, alcohol, drug abuse, habits such as gambling and others. They just mask the problem. When that dosage wears off, guess what happens? 
You know what happens, Ernie? You still got the problem. God doesn't mask our problem. God fixes problems. Amen? When you give in to depression, my friend, you give in to despair. Jack Handy wrote a funny book called Fuzzy Memories of My Life, and he tells a story when he was a young boy that a bully began to pick on him, demand him every day at lunch that he give him his lunch. Jack said he was a small boy, and so determined he would take karate. He took karate for a while, and then the instructor got such a big crowd that he had to start charging, charging the students $5. He said that he quit paying the $5 and started paying the bully again. He just completely give up and give in to despair. Cold. Training yourself to handle your despair is very important. I don't think we should try to, de to escape these times of depression, but I think we need to learn how to handle them. I don't care who you are, you're going to have places and times in your life uh, that are very difficult. An anonymous story is told, as a lady writes, as a mature lady, that things that she went through starting at the age of 12. She said that she was overwhelmed with guilt and despair. And at the age of 12, she began to feel so dirty physically and spiritually. She said at impulses, her father and mother would take her to a psychiatrist, and she would follow all instructions down to the very detail, and do good for a while, but reverted back quickly. And then she told the story how that she went, and she was taken to a Christian council that taught her that she needed to live out God's truths in her lives. She tells the story how that she applied the doctrines to her life, she meditated on the Word of God, and she memorized the Word of God. And she determined that the answer for her life was simply this, is that what God thought of her and not what she thought of her is what she needed in her life. And so what she was going through and how she found the answer to the challenges of her life was, my friend, in that she came to God and began to apply those truths in her life and began to live it out, and her life was transformed and delivered. My life or your life will never be transformed, my friend, without the place of salvation that gives to us, my friend, the power over depression and discouragement. And not only gives us the power, my friend, but it gives us the way. And my friend, you and I cannot walk with God for a lifetime, and that's what God expects us to do. He doesn't expect us to get saved, my friend, and walk only for a short time in life. He wants us to be completely transformed and changed, and our lives being changed. And we have all kinds of things that come on us and come to us, but God wants us to be transformed. And unless you learn all of these areas of your life, you will not Walk all the way through to the end. Patrick, I'm ahead of you a couple years. I got 42 in one place, amen. They tried to run me out, pack my stuff up, took it out of town, but I beat them back, amen. So I'm still here, amen. But God knows exactly, my friend, what you need not need. Knows exactly overcoming it. I'm going to move through this real quick. What brought discouragement to Elijah? I'll give you a few things. First of all is frustration. What doest thou here, Elijah, God said? Elijah, what in this world has brought you to this place of where you are? And he began to answer in verse number 10, and he said this. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant. They throw down my, thine altar. They slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He was frustrated with people. Another part of the message at another time. But can I say that if you want to get discouraged, then you, you watch people that you depend on and you expect, and my friend, they'll frustrate you if you're not very careful. And then I say, number two, that he was discouraged and depressed. Not only was he frustrated because of what others did, my friend, he was fearful what they do to him. She was fixing to kill him, buddy. She wanted to tan his hide and put it on the wall. She was after him. He was filled with fear. And then he was filled with fatigue. He was tired. You know, we are a trichotomy created after the image of God. We have a body part, we have a social part, we have a spiritual part. And all three, my friend, they need to be healthy and to be strong. And if we are fatigued or physically, my friend, the Bible says that he left, and it's very fascinating to me, that he left, and he left his servant in Bathsheba, the one that cared about him, cared for him, and served him. He hurt them in the middle of his depression because he didn't know how to handle it. He left him, he went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he went to sleep by a juniper tree. He was woke up, and God said, wake up, son, and he looked up, and this is always interesting to me. I love this part of it. I, I've, 
I use my mind of imagination here. He wakes up, and there's a cruise of oil, which we can, or excuse me, a cruise of water, and then, then there's a cake. I, it had to, be, had to be cornbread in it, black skillet, didn't it, amen? How many think that might be so? Uh, you, <laughs> I don't know, but I'd be looking around for the beans. How about you, amen? I was raised poor, but I was in Michigan, and up there, poor people eat macaroni and cheese. We don't get the good stuff like beans and fried taters, you know. We, we got cheated out of being poor, you know. Now, now watch this. Now, here's what's fascinating to me. The angel woke him up. Can I ask you this? Did God watch that man sleep when he was depressed and distraught? I think he did. I think God said, son, I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to give you all the rest you need, all the time you need. He woke up, and he ate, and he drank, and he he was told to lay back down again and go to sleep. And the next time he woke up, man, he had a super meal, buddy. Amen? Because he wanted the strength of it for 40 days and 40 nights. I want to get some of them, <laughs> them, them, them fast foods. Amen? Amen? And, and he went, what I'm trying to tell you, what I want you to see, what I want you to know, my friend, that there were some things that brought Elijah to discouragement, my friend, but there's some things, my friend, that the Lord did for the discouraged person. The first thing, my friend, the Lord seen him. Today the Lord sees you. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but how many of us have ever cried privately when we didn't want anyone to see us? When, when we were alone in our heart and we wanted to be there, and with brokenness we poured our heart out to God. I want you to know the things that the Lord did, and he does. First of all, he's seen the distraught, the discouraged man, Amen. The second thing, he served him. When he prepared that fire, them coals, he served him. And then he, he secured him. He gave him time to rest. He didn't hurry him, but my friend, he helped him through it. That's wonderful, my friend, that God will use that place and time in your life, my friend, to, to move you, give you time. And then he sent him. Okay, son. Got something for you to do. There's a king in Syria that needs to be replaced. When you get up and get going, then go to Syria and anoint him. There's a king in Israel that needs to be replaced. Then get up and get going. There's someone that needs to continue my work beyond you. And his name is Elijah. And you're going to find him and go and anoint him. And get on your way. He sent him. What does God do with you? You say, I am so distraught, so discouraged. I'm disappointed in me and life and others. Can I say that he sent him? He was not done yet. Amen? Can I say that God is not done with you yet? How many, how many believe that? Amen? Let's say that together. God is not done with me yet. That was real poor one more time. God is not done with me yet. How many believe it? Say amen. amen. You say, Pastor, if you knew all the stuff I, them golden eggs, you know what? I know somebody that does, and he said, he is not done with you yet. What changed Elijah? Two points, two thoughts, and I'm done. I don't have a time to develop it. He had a renewed vision of who God was. He'd forgotten. God, man, he'd forgotten. Just, just a chapter before, man, he brought the fire down from heaven. Just the chapter before the miracles of God, he'd forgotten who, who God was. God asked Elijah the second time, what you doing here, Elijah? And he told him the same exact word, the same verbiage, the exact same. He went through all the lists, and he said, I want you to go stand on the mount. He got up there, and you can read it when you have time. And the wind came by, and it tore the rocks, tore the rocks. But God was not in the rocks that were being rent by the wind. And then the Bible said the earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And then there was a fire. God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And that's where he found him. And this morning, I don't care where you're at, it's a still, small voice. You say, what is it, Pastor Lamb? What is the still, false, small voice? So you can identify it is the God of heaven by his Holy Spirit speaking to you. And what's the wonderful, wonderful thing about being a child of God What's a wonderful, wonderful thing about being one of God's creatures is that he speaks to us inside of us. Okay, so pastor, I've got a bunch of things that are inside of me. How do I know? What is this? Here's what you know. Here's where it is. 
you'll just know exactly. Though he doesn't speak the English tongue, he doesn't speak the, the Hebrew language or the Greek language in your ear or in your heart, he'll right now write on your heart exactly where and what you need to do. There's not one of us here. What changed Elijah? He had a renewed vision of who he was. Then lastly, and I'm done, Elijah got a renewed vision who he was, that he was not done. He was not done. His life wasn't, wasn't over. He needed to realize that he needed to use, listen to this, he needed to use these times of depression and discouragement to be drawn by God, to come close to him. 